further ado, I'm going to introduce um, Sister Hosea Harrow, who hails from McManus Chapter at the University of New Mexico School of Law. She's currently a member of the Robert E. Redding Alumni Chapter in DC. She works as the Democratic Counsel for the Chairman of the U.S. Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. She previously served as the Wilma Mankiller Legal Fellow at the National Congress of American Indians and also as a law clerk at the Office of the Solicitor in the Division of Indian Affairs at the U.S. Department of the Interior. While in law school, Connie earned a certificate in Indigenous Peoples Law. She also served on the Edison staff of the Tribal Law Journey Journal, taught for the Marshall Brennan Constitutional Literacy Project, and served as a legal observer for the Guantanamo Military Commission. Connie also holds a BA in History and a BA in Psychology with a minor in Political Science from the University of New Mexico. And now I'm going to turn it over to Connie, who will provide us with an overview of federal Indian law. And then, as I mentioned, we'll have time at the end for questions. Connie? Yat eh, everyone. She eh, can chet associate de haro, Yanishia. Tapahan nishlun, tachitni bashishin, honatni dashiche, do tapahan dashanele. Hello, everyone. My name's Connie Sosi de haro. Um, I am born for the Water's Edge clan. I mean, sorry, I am from the Water's Edge clan. I am born for red running into the water. My maternal grandfather is one who walks around you, and my, um, my paternal grandfather is Water's Edge. So that makes me a Navajo woman, and I'm really excited to be here um, with you guys today. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and start the, uh, the PowerPoint slide. Forgive me, I am new to doing all this, but I'm very excited to be doing it. <laughs> so welcome. This webinar is designed to give you a quick and broad overview of federal Indian law and policy. Uh, throughout my career and time in Phi Alpha Delta, I have received many questions from different people regarding Indian law. These questions range from cultural sovereignty, enrollment, adoption, and civil rights. I hope this webinar is helpful, and based on the interest, we hope to do a series in bringing guest speakers to discuss issues that tribes and Indigenous people face today. As I mention Indian law to those who are unfamiliar with it, they often ask why? Why Indian law? Well, aside from the fact that I am a Diné woman and entered the legal profession with the intention of helping our people, I feel it is important for every legal practitioner and law student to diversify their legal knowledge. As we move throughout our education and careers, we absorb information that will be helpful to our current and future clients. To ensure we are being the best lawyer we can be, diversifying your legal knowledge helps expand your horizons to ensure you can help your clients. Which brings me to, you may encounter in your practice, there are currently 574 federally recognized tribes and countless state recognized tribes. These tribes have their own political and justice systems that incorporate Western law with their unique cultural needs and identities. Simple knowledge like that can help guide you to the best resources if you have a client who is a tribal member. You will also gain a better understanding of the tribal sovereign nations in your state. I encourage anyone and everyone to take at least one Indian law class, and if your law school offers it, a CLE, or read one Indian law case. These educational resources will help you understand the history of various uh, tribes, why certain policies are in place, and why it is important to protect the sovereignty of these tribal nations. It will also broaden your horizons and challenge your ideas of what being a native person, tribal member, or tribal nation means in this modern era. For those of you who are here for DEI purposes, well, inclusion means including everyone. In discussions regarding diversity, inclusion, and equity, tribal people and nations are often left out of these conversations due to misinformation and lack of knowledge. When we are having these discussions, it is important we always include the first peoples of this land. Now, let's get into federal policies. It is helpful to understand federal Indian policies with a historical timeline. We have pre-contact, contact slash coexistence, removal, assimilation, reorganization, termination, and self-determination. Pre-contact is um, pretty obvious. It was prior to when European settlers arrived um, to this land. Contact slash coexistence is a time period with settlers and tribes coexisting on this land. 
Coexisting includes cooperation in wars, disease was rights, widespread and decimated tribal communities. This time period is also when first contact tribes established treaties. Treaties were negotiated between tribal nations and the United States to establish borders, and those were signed between these two parties. Removal is when the federal government established policies to forcibly remove Native people from their lands. Two well-documented forced relocations were the Trail of Tears and the Navajo Long Walk. Assimilation includes the allotment era in Indian boarding schools with the primary objective of civilizing or assimilating Native people into westernized culture. Many Native children were forced to abandon their cultures, cut their hair, and were often punished for speaking their language. This brutal era had, a, had lasting effects on generations of families. Reorganization refers to the Indian New Deal or the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934. A report known as the Merriam Report documented the years of failed federal Indian policy during the allotment era. This report helped encourage change such as the Reorganization Act. The act ended land allotment, restored tribal ownership of certain surplus lands, and encouraged tribal self-government. However, much of these policies um, and changes were required approval by the Secretary of the Interior, and often the one-size-fits-all policy did not work for all tribes. The termination era refers to the federal government policy of making tribal members subject to the same laws, privileges, and responsibilities of other U.S. citizens. This resulted in several tribes being terminated, which ended their political relationship with the United States. Lands were converted into private ownership or sold. Terminated tribes lost their land bases and plunged into economic depressions. The federal government also encouraged um, tribal members to utilize their relocation program to leave their homelands and find new life in urban areas. There are success stories. However, many also suffered the same economic disadvantages of the urban poor. And finally, tribal self-determination refers to the movement when tribes sought to restore their communities, achieve self-government, encourage cultural renewal, and exercise greater control of their futures. Through this era, there is a passage of the Indian Civil Rights Act, the Indian Financing Act, the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistant Act, Assistance Act, the Indian Child Welfare Act, the American Indian Religious Freedoms Act. This era also saw the rise of prominent Native leaders who changed federal policy and law. These leaders include John Echohawk and Ada Deer. Let's take a look at how federal, the federal role was established. Under the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution granted Congress the power to regulate commerce with tribes. This set forth the pattern of federal Indian law and policy. Between 1790 and 1834, Congress passed a series of trade and intercourse acts. These policies established federal control over the interaction between tribes and the general population. These acts also manage land policies, economic activities, and other activities that have become the bedrock of federal Indian policy today. To understand the formation of federal Indian law, one must review the Marshall Trilogy. The Marshall Trilogy are three cases that form the basic legal framework for indigenous land claims, tribal sovereignty, and the federal trust responsibility. Those three cases are Johnson v. McIntosh, Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, and Wooster v. Georgia. In Johnson v. McIntosh, this case, this case involved a land dispute between Thomas Johnson and William McIntosh. Johnson purchased land from the local tribe and McIntosh later obtained a patent to the same land from the U.S. federal government. The court was asked to settle this dispute and the court stated the tribe did not own the right to the land as the United States was the discovering nation. Thus, tribes could not sell lands to individuals. This is known as the doctrine of discovery. The court outlined the discovery doctrine that a discovering power gains the exclusive right to extinguish the right of occupancy of the indigenous occupants. The court further stated that when the colonies declared their independence from the crown, the U.S. inherited their right of preemption. An important note is that the tribe was not present at the arguments and they were also unable to contribute to the record. This, doc this doctrine of discovery has served as the basis for disregarding any indigenous claims to the land. The second case, Cherokee v. Georgia, um, discusses the multiple attempts by Georgia to extinguish Indian title to the land. Georgia enacted a series of laws that divided up Cherokee territory among several state counties and it extended state law into those territories. Those state laws invalidated Cherokee law and made any Cherokee attempts at self-governance illegal. To combat this intrusion, the Cherokee brought an original action in the Supreme Court as a foreign state within the meeting of Article 3, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution. 
This case established tribes were not foreign nations, but domestic dependent nations and likened the tribe's relationship with the U.S. as a guardian ward relationship. This case has a mixed history. This case laid groundwork for the future protection of tribal sovereignty, but also strengthened the view for those who believe tribes were not capable of governing themselves. And for the third case, uh, Wooster v. Georgia, in the next term, the Cherokee Nation returned to the Supreme Court. Several missionaries were arrested by Georgia authorities for violating a state law that required non-Indians to obtain a license before entering Cherokee territory. Two missionaries appealed their convictions and the court held that the state did not have the authority to control activity within Cherokee territory. The court further held that the Cherokee Nation is a distinct political community and protection does not imply the destruction of the protected. Despite this win, President Andrew Jackson proceeded with the Cherokee removal a few, years, a few years later. So I'm bringing this timeline back up um, so you can gain a sense of where we are at in history. As we move into the removal period where there are a few notable cases, um, but this is incredibly important um, because you will see how it affected how tribes were able to enforce um, their own traditional customary laws. During this period, the federal government established reservations to separate tribal nations from non-Indians. Over time, reservations came to be viewed as another method to civilize tribes. Each reservation had an Indian agent who was supposed to supervise the adaptation to Western lifestyle. This includes on-reservation and off-reservation schools that were directed by religious organizations. Their goals were to Christianize the native people. During this time, some tribes were still exercising their own traditional customary laws to settle disputes between tribal members. This led to the case of Ex parte Crow Dog. In 1881, a native man named Crow Dog shot and killed Spotted Tail, another native man. This matter was settled by the tribe and followed long-standing tribal customary law that had Crow Dog pay restitution to Spotted Tail's family. Despite this, the Indian agent had Crow Dog arrested and he was indicted by a federal grand jury for the murder and manslaughter of Spotted Tail. Crow Dog petitioned the Supreme Court for a writ of habeas corpus and the court accepted the case. The court held nine to zero that Congress had not granted federal court jurisdiction over Indian on Indian crimes. And there was nothing in subsequent treaties that repeal the tribe's jurisdiction. This landmark, was a win for, this landmark case was a win for Crow Dog. Um, however, this case marked the beginning of the federal government's erosion of tribal customary law. And now we're going into the Major Crimes Act. The court's decision from ex parte Crow Dog caused an uproar that resulted in congressional action. In 1885, Congress passed the Major Crimes Act, which placed seven major crimes under federal jurisdiction, exclusive of state jurisdiction, that were committed by a native person on another native person. These crimes included murder, manslaughter, rape, assault with the intent to kill, arson, burglary, and larceny. The constitutionality of this act was challenged in 1886 in United States versus Kagama. In this case, a native man named Kagama was accused of murder and the Department of Justice used this case to test the constitutionality of the Major Crimes Act. This case is important because it relied on the tribe's status as a domestic dependent nation that was previously determined in Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. Despite being good law, this case is still criticized for relying on powers that were not expressly granted to Congress. And despite the outcome of this case in favor of the tribes, Congress still passed the Dawes Act the following year. The Dawes Act marks a shift in federal Indian policy to allotment and assimilation. The Dawes Act was passed in 1887, which granted the federal government the authority to break up tribal lands. Some believe that if individual tribal members were given plots of land to cultivate, that would speed up the assimilation process into mainstream American culture. There was no provision for the consent or consultation um, from tribes or tribal people. This greatly reduced tribal lands from 139 million acres in 1887 to 48 million acres in 1934. 20 million of that 48 million acres were desert or semi-desert lands. Those who received allotments found themselves subject to state property taxation that they were not able to pay. This also resulted in selling of those allotments to pay those debts. In 
These practices also resulted in checkerboarded areas of land where it alternated between Indian and non-Indian ownership. As the allotment period was drawing to a close, Congress passed the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. This act conferred citizenship to all tribal people born in the United States. Despite this passage, not all Native Americans were granted citizenship and many were not able to vote due to state laws. And in 1928, the Miriam Report was published and documented the failures of federal Indian policy during the allotment era. The Miriam Report detailed the poverty and poor living conditions on reservations. Um, they also detailed high disease and death rates, inadequate care of Native children in boarding schools, and destructive effects caused by the Dawes Act. After the publication of this report, the Great Depression began and New Deal policies were designed. This included the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934. The Indian Reorganization Act formally ended the allotment practice and authorized the Secretary of the Interior to restore tribal ownership to any surplus lands acquired from tribes under the Dawes Act. It authorized the creation of new reservations and water rights. It also recognized tribal governments and promoted tribal self-government by encouraging tribes to set up their own constitutions. It is important to note that the 1934 version was not fully applicable to Alaska Native tribes. However, Congress corrected this in 1936. Alaska Native tribes are very different from those tribes in the lower 48. If there is interest, we can look into hosting another webinar um, primarily focused on Alaska. The Re Indian Reorganization Act was successful for some tribes. Um, however, the act suggested government frameworks that mimicked the United States style of governance. This one size fits all approach did not work. The act also did not stimulate economic progress or provide a usable structure for tribal politics. This led to a new change in federal, po federal Indian policy termination. By 1953, Congress formally adopted a termination policy for tribes. Terminating tribes would subject tribal members to the same law and privileges of other U.S. citizens. This meant the political relationship with the federal government ended and lands were converted into private ownership or sold. Two of the largest terminated tribes were the Klamath of Oregon and the Menominee of Wisconsin. In 1953, Congress enacted Public Law 280, which established a method where states may assume jurisdiction over reservation tribes. The act had a mandatory transfer of federal law enforcement authority to state authorities in six states, California, Minnesota, with the exception of one tribe, Nebraska, Oregon, with one exception, Wisconsin, and Alaska upon statehood. Other states were allowed to enact a similar transfer of power if the tribes consented to do so. Those states were Arizona, Florida, Idaho, Iowa, Montana, Nevada, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, and Washington. The addition of PL 280 added to a very complex jurisdiction matrix in Indian country. And as you can see here, it is very complex. One has to take into consideration if the perpetrator or victim is native, what is the type of crime, and what other crimes fall under specific jurisdictions. But there are also many other outside factors that one has to take into consideration when determining criminal jurisdiction in Indian country. As the federal government moved forward with termination policies, the Bureau of Indian Affairs within the Department of the Interior attempted to encourage Native people to leave their homeland and relocate to the urban cities. This encouragement was to decrease the high unemployment rates on reservations and the Bureau offered grants to Native people who left. However, many Native people were unable to find employment in urban areas and suffered the usual problems of the urban poor. This was added on to the trauma of dislocation. It is also important to note that during this time, uranium mining was occurring on tribal lands, especially in the Southwest. The effects of uranium mining had lasting and devastating effects on native people, and there are still open mines that have not been cleaned up. Also of note, during this time period, over 100 tribes were terminated and 1,365,801 acres of trust land were removed from their protected status and over 13,000 tribal members lost their tribal affiliation. 
This era had devastating effects on tribal sovereignty, culture, and economic welfare. Let me bring up the timeline again so we can see where we're at. And we're gonna start moving into uh, the self-determination era. By the early 60s, many federal leaders began opposing termination policies. Presidents Johnson and Nixon began encouraging tribal self-determination, and this started a transition into the new era of tribal self-determination. Just as a forewarning, we might move through this a little fast because tribal self-determination, it starts from the early 60s and starts moving into current times, which is the modern era that we are in now. As I mentioned before, federal policy began to change on focusing on empowering tribes as termination and assimilation were largely failures. During the self-determination era, you will see there's a lot of movement towards restoration of tribal judicial systems, reinforcing tri treaty rights, um, regaining land, and reinforcing tribal sovereignty. Tribal nations and their political systems and traditions predate the United States. In 1896, the Supreme Court in Talton v. Mays held that tribal nations were distinct independent political communities that predated the Constitution. And during the civil rights era, there were concerns about violations against Native individuals, and this was also a turbulent time in tribal politics. Congress passed the Indian Civil Rights Act to impose most requirements of the Bill of Rights, such as protected free speech, free exercise of religion, due process, and equal protection. During this same year, the American Indian Movement was founded in Minneapolis, Minnesota. As you can see uh, that I am including some notable events with AIM and Sachin Littlefeather addressing the Academy Awards. A documentary on her speech will be released soon. But getting back to the policy side of things, you have the Indian Financing Act of 1974, which was created to reduce the disparity of access to, for business capital for native people. Then there is the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act of 1975, aka Public Law 9368, which enabled the federal government to make direct contracts with tribes for implementation of programs and distributions of funds. If you ever hear of a 638 program, that's where that number comes from. Tribes use this authority to administer healthcare services, education, public safety initiatives, including law enforcement, forest preservation programs, tribal food programs, and so on. As you can see, there is a lot of legislative movement and court cases being decided regarding tribal sovereignty. There are many court cases that discuss hunting and treaty rights, criminal and civil jurisdiction, contracts, property rights, taxation, and gaming. To try to fit this whole into one webinar, well, honestly, we would be here all night, but I'm happy to do <laughs> to see if we can find some um, if we can find uh, more people to discuss these. As you go through the list here, you can see that we have the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act in 1976, 1978, we have the Indian Child Welfare Act, American Religious Freedom Act, 1988, we have the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, 1990, the Native American Ga Graves and Repatriation Act, and in 1990, we have Duro versus Reina. I included this case because the case because it is very unique. Um, the court held that tribes could not prosecute individuals who were not members of their own tribe. For example, um, if I, as a Navajo person, committed a crime on Cherokee land, under this decision, Cherokee Nation could not prosecute me. This decision was not well received by tribes and added a further complication to, ju to criminal jurisdiction in Indian country. In response, Congress amended the Indian Civil Rights Act to include the power to exercise jurisdiction over all natives. This amendment was known as the Durofix. And then we go on and you can see we have uh, the Native American Housing Assistance and Self-Determination Act in 1996. And um, lots of fast forwarding. <laughs> and in 2013, the US Commission on Civil Rights releases a study called A Quiet Crisis, Federal Funding and Unmet Needs in Indian Country. 2010, we have the Tribal Law and Order Act. 2013, we have the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, which includes specific provisions to protect Indian women within Indian country. 2016, we have the Standing Rock protest start. And I also included the Dollar General case because this was the one case in modern Indian law history 
that could have devastated civil jurisdiction in Indian country. The Supreme Court considered whether a tribal court had jurisdiction to hear a civil case involving a non-Indian who operated a store on tribal land. This case called into question decades of precedent and ultimately the court was split 4-4 and thus affirmed the lower court decision that tribal courts did have jurisdiction over the non-Indian who operated the store within Indian lands. And here in 2018, you can see they released another report titled Broken Promises, Continuing Federal, with Federal Funding Shortfalls for Native Americans. In 2018, we have the historical election of Congresswoman Sharice Davids and Congresswoman Deb Holland. And in 2020, we have the decision from McGirt v. Oklahoma. I included the McGirt case because this case ruled that the eastern part of Oklahoma was never disestablished and still considered Indian country. This landmark decision was widely celebrated by tribes. My favorite quote from the case is, today we are asked whether, this, whether the land these treaties promise remains an Indian reservation for purposes of federal criminal law. Because Congress has not said otherwise, we hold the government to its word. And today in 2021, we now have the nomination of Congresswoman Deb Holland for the Secretary of the Interior. After decades of turbulent federal policies that had lasting effects on our people, this nomination is widely celebrated and a welcome change. To have one of our own people in charge of this agency is nothing short of remarkable. As I bring this presentation to a close, I have a list of resources to help your research or provide answers to questions that I just don't have the answers to. Um, I am not an expert. I am still learning every single day about this area of law. Um, even though I've lived it, I have, I am the product of a lot of these policies. I still learn something new every single day. And I hope that this helps guide your understanding about the policies and laws that affect our indigenous people. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, Connie. That was a lot of wonderful information. Um, so as I mentioned at the top of the webinar, we now have some time for questions. And the good news is that although that was a ton of information, Connie did save us some extra time for questions. Um, and we, so the first question that we have, um, were indigenous governments that more closely resembled U.S. government structures treated with less hostility by the U.S. government than those indigenous governments that did not? I think I'm gonna to have to give you the standard lawyer answer that we all love to give. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> um, it, it really did vary from tribe to tribe. So for instance, um, the Cherokee Nation had uh, begun the process of utilizing a very similar governance structure and they were welcomed uh, by the federal government. Um, however, when other tribes uh, try to set up their own systems or even try to do something similar, like for example, my tribe, um, we, we, had a, we had a very difficult uh, time doing so. So I think it just really depends on which tribe and at what point in history, uh, what was going on. I like that it depends. It's very much a lawyerly answer. Um, you shared a number of resources at the end of your presentation. And now that you've said you'll, you're willing to share it with uh, our attendees, is there a resource that you would recommend they start with if they don't know anything in, about this area of law? Um, I would say a really good, like little, a little, little book, little, <laughs> a little book would be um, uh, the Nutshell series. So my copy is actually kind of old, um, but it's still really good. It has a lot of different things like um, it divides it up into certain categories like Indian gaming, individual rights, um, Aboriginal titles. So it's a really helpful little primer if you're interested. Um, another thing, if you can afford it, <laughs> um, is the Cohen's Handbook on Indian Law. It's a great resource. Um, it's very detailed and it has a lot of the history that, um, that I very briefly went over. So I definitely recommend those two book resources, but you have a ton of websites available at your disposal as well. Like you have the Tribal Law Clearinghouse, you have the, um, uh, 
you have the you have like various different law school websites. Turtle Talk is an excellent resource as well. So definitely, um, definitely recommend a lot of those. Great. Um, Connie, can you talk a little bit more about the dollar general case? I know that was toward the end of your presentation. Um, and that was an interesting decision that came out a few years back. Can you talk a little bit more about that case and why it's important when we're talking about this topic? Sure. Um, so Dollar General is, whoops, sorry. <laughs> I thought I accidentally closed the webinar. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so Dollar General is super, is one of those important cases because as we, as we sort of went over, you see that jurisdiction in Indian country was slowly eroded over time. And it's a very complicated process of who gets jurisdiction over what, when, and where, and where does the case like go to? So here in Dollar General, because it was civil jurisdiction, which is completely different from criminal, and quite frankly, a little bit more, um, a little bit more complicated. Um, typically, what has to happen is that there has to be an exhaustion. So if there's something that comes forth to, if something occurs, then you have to go to tribal court before you can go to any other court. And that's what came up in this case, where as you can see, you know, the long history of jurisdiction is very complicated and it's oftentimes unclear when does the tribe actually have jurisdiction and when, when don't they? And in this case, it was very apparent to those of us who, 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 um, who practice Indian law that, you know, the, the details of this case demonstrate that there is no way that tribes, the tribe wouldn't have jurisdiction over this case because it was, it occurred on tribal land. The, the, the business had a license from the tribe. Uh, the owner had the consent of the tribe to be there it's just all these little like things that show that there was an established relationship between the tribe and the business owner. And a lot of that is built into previous cases. And so when this came up to the Supreme Court, a lot of people were concerned because if the court ultimately decided that the tribal court did not have jurisdiction over this case, it would upend a lot of previous decisions that would allow tribal courts to have jurisdiction over non-Indians. And that in turn would just make things extremely more complicated. So it was very important that we paid attention to this case. And I actually attended the oral arguments and I was scared the whole time too. So um, it's, it, it, it was a very, very important case. And jurisdiction in Indian country is just so complicated. We could dedicate like a whole class to it. Um. We have a question about uh, tribal immunity. Um, so the attendee wants to know, do tribes waive immunity if they run a business off the reservation, particularly if you cannot tell the business is Indian owned? Um, we don't know that for sure, to be honest. Um, I don't necessarily practice in that area. So I think it just ultimately depends on a lot of different factors. Um, and as you can see that there, a lot of it is influenced by other cases that aren't Indian law specific. Like if you look at the Wayfair case, um, you can see that that does actually have some tie into your question. So I, as somebody who doesn't necessarily practice in that area, I don't wanna give you, a, I don't have a clear answer for you, but I know people who can help you figure that out. <laughs> Sometimes the best answers we can give as lawyers is I have somebody who can answer your question. Um, Connie, we have another question about um, doing business with um, tribes. So this question is, what is the current status of doing business with Native tribes in terms of policy and or law? It varies from tribe to tribe, to be honest with you, because tribes establish their own business practices and licensing procedures and also um, frankly, who can and cannot um, do business on land. So for example, like businesses in on my tribe, uh, they're very different from how like other tribes are. So like you have the California rancherias where their business structure is way different than ours. And so it just really depends from tribe to tribe. And if you have something that 
if you have a client who has those kinds of questions, it's really best to go directly to the tribe and find out and ask. Um, because they are the ones who not only shaped that policy, but they can also give you a clearer answer of what is or isn't allowed and what can or cannot be done within their within their um, within their lands. Okay, great. I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. Um, we have a question: What factors would influence a state to adopt Public Law 280 jurisdiction? How has state jurisdiction over tribes been received by those respective tribes? Again, sorry, it depends. <laughs> um, uh, some tribes have been okay with it because they don't have the, unfortunately, they just don't have the infrastructure to have their own public safety, to have their own public safety facilities. So like some of them, you know, don't have jails. Some of them don't have adequate law enforcement. Um, some of them just don't have the space. So in PL280 states, some tribes are okay with it and some, and some aren't um, because they would prefer that they not only enforce their own laws, but they hire their own people and making sure that their communities are safe because then you take have to look into consideration of like, what about a tribe that's in a rural area? Um, what's the response time going to be if somebody calls and there's there's trouble? You know, it's those types of factors that, that have to be taken into consideration. And I don't necessarily want to say like, all tribes are okay with it or all tribes are not okay with it because that's just not the case. Um, as I said before my presentation, there's no one size fits all answer for Indian country because every tribe is so different. And I think that um, it would just really depend. Um, we have one uh, follow-up question regarding PL280 and that is where someone could find uh, the table that you shared about criminal jurisdiction Sure. Um, I actually got that from, I think it's the Tribal Clearinghouse Institute. Let me double check. Great resource. Lots of information. Love them. Um, let's see. But I also like to keep, I also like to go in with the caveat that uh, that table is not, you know, the end all be all of jurisdiction in Indian country. So <laughs> um, I think it's a helpful guide. Um, so I found that at the Tribal Court Clearinghouse. So that's tribal-institute.org. Great, thanks, Connie. Um, this is kind of related to, in terms of the discussion we've been having about uh, criminal law as it pertains to Indian country. Um, and this is a very, I would say, broad question. So happy to hear your insight. Um, how does or did Indian law differ from American law did, does Indian law have more of a focus on restorative versus punitive? So I think that it's very different um, because American law, when we review the history of American law, it's very much based off of, you know, like European structures and Westernized cultures. Whereas here, tribes have a different approach um, one, one resource that I really love people to read is, um, is an article by a Navajo, by a Navajo chief justice. Um, he wrote about restorative justice and tribal law. And it's a great article because it does highlight a lot of the differences between how tribes approach the law as to a more westernized approach to law and how are we able to work those work those two systems so they're accomplishing not only justice for um, whoever is involved but also making sure that we are taking a holistic approach to ensuring that this individual the other individual who committed whatever crime or whatever is going on is able to not only go to not only go forth and continue in society, but also able to address a lot of the traumas that have been inflicted on them. Because as you can see, you know, when we were going through the history that there has been a lot of events that have affected the tribal peoples of this country. So it's important that as native people that we take a step back and take a view of everything of this wider picture to see what we can do to make sure that everybody 
will be able to continue forward in a good way. Great, we're gonna um, shift gears just a little bit here. Um, we have a question, to what extent do tribes have sovereign relations with non-US nations? In other words, do tribes have diplomatic relations with non-US countries? I don't have a good answer for that, to be honest with you. I know that there are some tribes who have, um, who have established relationships with other foreign nations. Um, I know some of it has been controversial, so I don't, I don't necessarily have a list, <laughs> um, but you can definitely like, you can research it and Google it and see that there are some tribes who have established relationships with other, with other countries. And you can also see that um, there are also a lot of tribes that participate at the United Nations, especially when it comes to uh, indigenous peoples. And there's also relationships that tribes have established prior to the U.S. Constitution or even during then, um, for example, like the relationship between, uh, I think it's the Choctaw and the Irish people. So it's it, it just depends on the tribe and the nature of that relationship and, you know, when that relationship was established. But it's, a, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And it, the, the relationship between these two sovereign entities is, is really cool. <laughs> Yeah, Connie, so you mentioned the word fascinating and you and I had a chance to speak briefly before the top of um, the program, but um, the number of federally recognized tribes in the United States was, was very eye-opening to me. Um, is there any insight you'd like to share about um, the, the process by which those tribes have gone about becoming federally recognized? What does that process look like? Is that something that happened long ago? Is it something that's ongoing? Is there a process you have to continue to follow to maintain that federal recognition? Um, it's a very complicated process. Um, so federal recognition often goes through the Department of the Interior and they have a very long process of how tribes go about doing that. But that process was also, it's not streamlined <laughs> and it was also disrupted by court decisions that determined like, well, when were you considered a tribe? Um, and that has a lot of controversy involved with it as well, which you can do a lot of research on your own time. Um, I think that, uh, I think that, um, that it's, it's interesting because you have a lot of tribes who are still fighting to be federally recognized and there's often like two avenues that they can go. One is to go through the Department of the Interior and the other avenue is through congressional action. And either road is not very easy. It's often long, it's often complicated, um, but I think that definitely uh, federal recognition is very timely, it's very costly, and hopefully um, a lot of people uh, can understand why it's it's such a it's such a complicated process. Like even if you look at the Department of Interior's website for this information, you just get like pages upon pages upon pages of how of how to go about it. And even if a tribe does make it to the point where they get a decision, and if it's not the outcome they hoped for, they still can appeal it, and then you go through the appeals process. So it's very long. It's very complicated, and. Um, you know, it, it's important to a lot of tribes to be federally recognized. So we have a question about um, trees between the tribes and the United States federal government. Um, so what is the significance of treaties both between the tribes and the US federal government and treaties between world powers such as between Imperial Russia and the US for the Alaska Purchase? Sorry, that was quite a long question. <laughs> Let me see. Okay. Um, so treaties between tribes were made between two sovereign entities and our treaties detail um, what we are trading our land for. So for example, like in my tribe's treaty, we made sure to include provisions for education and um, food and also um, other sorts of resources and making sure that the land bases that we were given were within our sacred areas. So I think that's um, 
I think it's different than how rural powers interact with each other. And a lot of tribes have different, a lot of tribes in their different, in their different respective treaties have also very similar provisions. Like I've heard of some tribes uh, requiring the federal government to give them like boxes of clothing like every year or so, and they still honor that today. And I think that's what's, I think that's what's different from uh, treaty making with rural powers. Great, thanks Connie. Um, here's an interesting question. Where historic tribal lands have crossed international borders with Canada and Mexico, is there any way that tribal members on both sides of the border can act as one tribe in terms of self-determination and law enforcement? I think that's a complicated answer. Um, from strictly from a native person perspective, um, <laughs> not representative of my job, not representative of any opinions of the US federal government. Um, I think borders are arbitrary on stolen land. <laughs> um, but I think that it's, it's really tough because, you know, you hear about what's going on on the border, like between the Tohono O'odham Nation, or also like what's going on up in Canada with the Mohawk Nation. Um, I think that it just really depends on what they have detailed in a lot of their own internal agreements, but also what they can work out together because ultimately it's really up to the tribe to figure out how to not only allocate resources, but also making sure that everybody has equal access to different things. So I think it's, I think it's just one of those really tough questions to answer. And I definitely hope that a lot of tribal nations are able to, um, with international borders, are able to, to resolve that. So we have um, a specific scenario where um, one of our attendees indicates that sometimes she or he encounter um, clients um, where they uh, have a relative who's a tribal member and the client wants to determine if they are eligible to enroll in the tribe, but they may or may not know the specific tribe. So the question is, can you recommend a direction to point them in to explore their ancestry and eligibility for tribal membership? I think that's a little bit difficult to do, um, especially if they don't know which tribe, um, because even if you are doing a lot of these DNA tests, they're not specific to like which region, because as you've seen in my presentation, there was a lot of movement, a lot of forced relocation, and a lot of tribes are not in where their historical homelands used to be. And so I think it's difficult. Um, if they have any idea of which tribe, it's always best to go directly to the tribe and ask what their enrollment procedures are and how one can get established because each tribe has their own eligibility criteria um, for example, like some tribes do theirs based on lineage, um, other tribes do them on blood quantum. So it just, it's really, perf it's, it's really better to just go directly to the actual tribal enrollment office. All right. Um, we have a question. What does tribal government look like generally? And does it vary by tribe? Are there elected representative bodies such as the House of Representatives, Senate, or do the tribes have a different governmental structure? It really varies from tribe to tribe. So like, for example, my tribe, we have a very similar structure to the federal government. We have a judicial system, we have an executive branch, and we have a legislative branch. Um, except instead of representatives in a Senate, we have what we call a council. Um, but we have a president, we have a vice president, we have a chief justice, um, and we have our own little Supreme Court. Um, but other tribes are very different. So like if you look at, if you look at like how Pueblo government, governments are set up, those are really based in traditional and customary laws of their own people. And they, some of them are elected. Uh, others um, are like lineage, not lineage, but like, you know, the next person in line, <laughs> as it were. Um, and so it just, it varies from government to government. Like Cherokee Nation is very similar too. You know, they have elections every single they have elections for every single um, chief and it, it, it varies widely across Indian country. So it's, it's pretty unique. 
so we have gotten a couple of questions that I'm going to try to consolidate into a single question. So um, for someone who wants to practice in this area, um, are there particular courses they should take in law school? Is there a particular law school they should attend? Is there a different licensing process or where they should be barred? You know, if I want to get into this and I'm a law student, what advice could you give me, Connie? Um, I think if you're interested in this, definitely take an Indian law class. Um, I think that there's a lot of law schools now that are offering just like a general 101 course. And it's super helpful because you're able to get <laughs> to the nitty gritty details that we weren't able to get into in this very short amount of time. Um, but also through that, you'll be able to gain access to like different people who are in the community and are experts in this field and know so much information and different people. So you can make all those connections to start to develop your career um, in Indian law. I don't really, I don't necessarily recommend like one law school because I think that a lot of law schools have a lot of really great Indian law programs. Um, I mean, University of New Mexico has a great one, Arizona State University, University of Arizona, uh, Washington, um, Wisconsin, even, uh, I think like even some of the East Coast schools actually have Indian law programs. So if this is something you're interested in, definitely check with your law schools to see like, you know, do you offer this program? Because sometimes they only offer them once per year um, just because, you know, faculty is stretched thin. Um, but also you can also make the connections like with the National Native American Law Students Association and make those connections to make more connections in the Indian law practitioner community. Great. Um, so we have a, a lot of questions, Connie. We have about six minutes left, so I'm going to do my best um, to ask as many of them as possible, but I apologize in advance to those of you whose questions we don't get to. Uh, Connie and I will, will chat afterwards and see if there's a, a means by which we can get you some answers to those questions we don't have a chance to get to. Um, so there was one follow-up question. Um, what was the name of the article by the Navajo Chief Justice talking about the difference between Western and tribal justice? I just looked that up. That's so funny. Um, <laughs> so the title is Life Comes From It, Navajo Justice Concepts. And that's by Chief Justice Robert Yazzie. I can give you the site as well. I will give you guys two seconds to get something. <laughs> um, it's 24 NM, like New Mexico, L rev like law review 175 and it's the spring 1994 edition thanks connie um so kind of a couple questions said i believe tie us up here what are some key areas for tribal policy that you feel will be important for the next 20 to 30 years that's a long time <laughs> a lot of things um definitely shift very quickly as you saw in my presentation um i think like probably the effects of the pandemic and addressing recovery after the pandemic. Um, for me, I see firsthand how the pandemic has af affected my tribe. At one point, we had the highest infection rate in the nation. And it's devastating. And it's worrisome because the people that this virus has targeted are our cultural keepers. You know, there are language speakers, there are elders, there are keepers of traditional knowledge. So I think like that's definitely going to be a priority in the next couple of years, definitely in the next 20, as far as like future outlook goes. Um, I think anything's really up for grabs. It just depends on, you know, what's going on in history. And as you can see, um, the pendulum can swing very quickly <laughs> depending on what's going on in the world. But I definitely think that like addressing the after effects of the pandemic is going to be on everybody's mind and making sure that we not only protect our people, but also protect our cultural resources so we can pass that on to future generations. Great. I'm going to share um, some information that an attendee shared with us in the chat for everyone. It's a great resource from the San Diego Law Library. They did a year long focus on Indian country and tribal law in 2019. So make sure you guys all check that out. Um, thanks, Connie. Um, would you say that in your current role as the Democratic Council for the Chairman of the U.S. Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, you have had the opportunity to help shape policy related to federal Indian law? 
Absolutely. I think that like one of the really great things is that um, people, women like me, um, Native women who are working in the halls of Congress, we're in these places that were designed to not be for us. And they were, these are these places that enacted policies, as you saw, to terminate us or to assimilate us and to get rid of our cultural heritage. And I think that for not just me, but other Native people and other Native women who are now working in those same halls, it is a huge, um, it makes a huge difference because we are lending our voices and our lived experiences to make sure that whatever legislation gets put out um, has input, not just from us, but also making sure that we prioritize uh, input from tribal nations. Thank you so much, Connie. So we have just a few moments left. Um, for those of you whose questions we didn't get to, Connie and I will, will chat after and come up with a good plan to try and answer as many of those as we can. Also, I noticed a number of you put some ideas for future webinars related to Indian law. That's great. We'll certainly um, pass those along to the folks who work on our webinar series. But Connie, I wanted to give you the last minute and the last word. So what do you want us to carry away from this webinar and any parting thoughts you might have? So I hope that this webinar was helpful for, um, for a lot of you. And I hope that it helped provide some guidance um, as to not only just the history of indigenous people in the United States, but also a lot of the policy. And I hope that um, we all gain a better understanding and are able to have a lot of these conversations and to make sure that the indigenous perspective is always included. And with that, I would like to say thank you for having me here today. And, um, and I hope that you guys will continue forth and doing all the good work. Thank you so much, Connie. Thank you to all of those who have joined us this evening. Please stay tuned for the next episode in our webinar series, um, which should be announced here shortly. Hope you're all today safe and well, and we'll see you all soon.